Hello. On October 16th, 2020, almost one year ago, I was dismissed from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, a sanctioned issue resulting from a charge of COVID-19 testing non-compliance. About a week later, I filed an appeal on the ground that the sanctions imposed were not appropriate for the violation. This appeal was denied. I am making this video for two main reasons. Number one, I have been wanting to compile a complete work that expands upon exactly what happened in full detail given the sheer complexity of this events, which may already be evidenced by the length of this video. This way, instead of needing to produce a lengthy explanation to each person I communicate with, I can simply share this video and ameliorate any remaining confusion afterward. Number two, as a personality-driven content creator on the internet, I am inclined to share this situation with my audience as it had a significant impact on my life, in which, for better or for worse, my audience is invested in. Additionally, I feel it would be deceitful to keep something like this a secret in the long run. Today, I will try my best to provide an accurate summary of events, including all relevant evidence and documents, while redacting private information like names of non-public figures and certain locations. I will also expand upon my honest retrospective thoughts about the situation, as well as the university's handling of cases similar to mine. Lastly, I will outline everything that has happened since, and my plans for the future. If you'd like to have a written version of this video, or you simply do not have time to watch or listen to this video in its entirety, I've included a full transcript as well as a shortened summary in this YouTube video's description box. Also in the description you can find all documents and evidence I mention in this video, including my communications with university faculty, statements from relevant people, articles about UIUC COVID-19 testing non-compliance discipline cases similar to mine, and more. In May of 2020, two months after the COVID lockdowns first began, I graduated from my local high school in Illinois. I was to attend the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, abbreviated as UIUC, to pursue a degree in economics. My plan was to graduate from the university in three years, after which I would enroll in law school and, if possible, study media law. At the same time, the chancellor of UIUC, Robert J. Jones, had announced that all students residing on the UIUC campus would be required to complete a COVID-19 saliva test twice a week. This testing expectation was communicated to me and all others through email. On August 17th, my roommate and I moved into our dorm building located on campus. It was recommended by our dorm staff that I receive a COVID-19 saliva test the next day, the one that was required by the university. Accordingly, on August 18th, my roommate and I went together, first to retrieve our school ID cards, and then to a COVID testing center across the street. After waiting in line for a bit, I was given a test tube to drool saliva into, and then was told to stand in an isolated spot while I attempt to produce the required amount of saliva about two to three milliliters. It took most people about two minutes to spit this amount of saliva into the tube, but for a reason unbeknownst to me at the time, I was unable to accumulate a single drop. Later, I would deduce that my inability to produce any saliva whatsoever at that moment was a result of a dry mouth condition, which I suppose should have been expected. This is the first time I moved out of my parents' house for a prolonged period of time, and I guess in the midst of trying to move in, set up my equipment, and get settled in as a first year student, I just did not remember to drink enough water. All of this added to the fact that fundamentally I've always had a relatively dry mouth given my inability to spit on command like a baseball player as my friends were always able to do. After 15 minutes of trying to drool into the test tube during which I experienced unpleasant gag reflexes, I decided to call it quits and turn in an empty tube. I remember the man at the counter laughing when I asked him is this enough while pointing to a completely empty test tube. He was understandably confused. He told me that the test would come back as incomplete, which I had to accept. Now, I knew that I had to find a way to satisfy this bi-weekly testing requirement. Over the next few days, I was trying to figure out what to do, and I was quite upfront about the problem with the people I talked to. For example, when my parents asked me about COVID testing, I responded in our group text chat on August 19th, quote, I got ID, I wasn't able to do COVID test because I didn't have enough saliva. My dad advised me to quote, drink liquids, and also during a phone call with my mom, when we talked about my dry mouth issue, she told me the same thing. And so I tried. I tried drinking some water and then attempting to drool into my dorm's bathroom sink as if I were taking the saliva test, but I still just was not able to produce any saliva. I tried doing the same thing many times across several days, but each time, 
I found no success. I have evidence of me googling on August 21st, quote, how to get saliva, and then right after, quotes, how to produce more saliva for test. I tried different approaches, different mouth movements. I even explicitly remember standing over the bathroom sink thinking about steak trying to produce saliva that way. But to my increasing frustration, nothing worked. Each time I tried, I had very little saliva in my mouth, not to mention attempting to extract that amount. Retrospectively, I think it's somewhat reasonable to assume that part of my problem was my worrying, since nerves and anxiety further cause dry mouth. Now, here's where I made my mistake. While I searched for solutions, I never directly reached out to the university's health building, the McKinley Health Center, for help and for advice. To not reach out was the wrong decision, and I will explain why in a bit. Before I do, let me explain how I was reasoning at the time. Again, this reasoning is faulty, but here is what I was thinking. If I were to reach out to the McKinley Health Center, I was anticipating that they would offer me very similar advice to what I had already been reading, advice which was already not working. Then once they would find out that I was still unable to test despite their recommended strategies, I thought I would either have to A, receive testing from a third party off campus, which would be a major transportation burden given that I did not have a vehicle on campus, or B, be forced to leave campus and go back home, thus wasting thousands of dollars on unused food and housing, all because I couldn't figure out how to spit in a tube. Both of these scenarios would have just been embarrassing, and I did not want to risk it. Now again, I should be very clear. Not reaching out was a mistake. It was wrong. If I had not avoided COVID testing, I would have been more certain that those around me were protected from catching the virus. Additionally, I would have learned that the university was indeed offering nasal swab alternatives. Had I known about the alternative testing method, I would have taken that option so that I could have been compliant with the testing policy. In total, I was non-compliant with the university testing policy for a little over one month until October 4th, which is when I started regularly testing. I will expand upon how I was indeed able to start testing in a bit. Going back, however, because I had decided to give up on saliva testing for the time being, I took on many preventative measures to ensure that I would not catch nor spread COVID-19. Measures that were in addition to the basics, like washing my hands frequently, wearing a mask, and socially distancing. First, I decided to take all of my courses online for that semester. Most classes were only being conducted online anyway, but in specific, I had the option of taking Philosophy 103 and Music 475 in person, but I chose to take the online versions of both. I never saw nor met up with any of my classmates or teachers throughout the entire semester, thus eliminating any chance of transmission. Second, I never attended any large social gatherings or events on campus, including my extracurricular activities, which were all conducted online. Whenever I did meet up with someone, it was almost always for a one-on-one -on -one tennis match, which was allowed under university policy, and I also felt was acceptable because tennis is a very socially distanced sport. For the purpose of full transparency, I will provide a list of places I went outside my dorm building during my period of non-compliance. Other than the university tennis courts, I went to a gas station outside of campus, the Chipotle on the northwest side of campus, which I visited a total of two times, and the Taco Bell five minutes outside of campus, which I visited a total of one time. Many of these places I visited on a Sunday, the day that my dorm building does not offer any in-house food. So if I wanted to eat, I really had no choice. Third, the only way I ever talked to or hung out with people within my dorm building was exclusively online. In fact, given my partnership with Discord Incorporated and my experience in running communities using their tools, I created and set up our dorm building's online communication platform. It ended up being the dorm's main platform for events and social gatherings during the pandemic, used by residents and resident assistants alike. Aside from my dorm room, the only place I visited within my dorm building was the dining hall, from which I would pick up food to bring to my dorm room and eat away from all other residents. On September 24th, about a month after I'd moved in, I received my first, and what ended up being my only, warning 
about my COVID-19 testing non-compliance. I was told by someone working in UIUC discipline that the reason there was about a month delay between my initial non-compliance and when the tracking system caught my non-compliance was due to technical issues with the system. Regardless, the email said, quote, Dear students, if you are receiving this message, the Office for Student Conflict Resolutions records indicate that as of this morning you are non-compliant with the university's COVID-19 testing requirements. This is a serious matter and requires your immediate attention. The message then stated that I must get tested if I already hadn't been, which, based on my dry mouth condition and my previous trial and error, I assumed I physically would not be able to do. This made me very worried. The email then stated, quotes, You may also be contacted by a university case coordinator soon regarding your status. If that happens, you should also follow their directions. The email also went on to say, quotes, If you are contacted directly by a case coordinator in the meantime, you should explain your situation to them. So I decided, after reading that email, that my best option, given my dry mouth condition and the preventative measures that I was actively taking, was indeed to wait for this case coordinator from the university to reach out to me so that I could explain my situation and find a way to move forward. I was actually genuinely excited that I could finally tackle this problem and continue my studies without the constant unease of not being able to fulfill this bi-weekly testing requirement. All the while, I continued acting upon the preventative measures that I listed earlier. On September 29th, five days after my first warning, I was charged with a violation of student code 1302A3 COVID-19 testing non-compliance. I found out about this charge another five days later on October 4th in an automated email sent by my case coordinator. The letter stated, quote, The Office for Student Conflict Resolution has received information in which it is alleged that on September 29th, 2020, you were involved in an incident which may violate the student code at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It is alleged that the private certified housing office has verified that you have a contract in the campus geographical footprint where it is required for students to comply with twice-weekly COVID-19 tests. Such conduct, if proven, would fall within the jurisdiction of the student discipline system and would constitute a violation of our community standards. I remember it was a Sunday afternoon when I first read that charge notice, and it was the first time that I realized just how big of a problem I had in my hands. Throughout the time I was in high school, every teacher I knew and every student I knew would confirm to you that I was the straight A nerd with a kooky personality who never got into any trouble. So to receive such a notice from the university that I would be charged with a violation of the student code of conduct. This really set me straight. Basically, the threat of a sanction instilled an enormous sense of urgency. I read that email and dropped everything I was doing so I could figure this out. Shortly after, I ate a bunch of Tic Tacs to induce salivation, something I had never tried before, and I also drank two bottles of water for the same reason. I waited some time to ensure that the Tic Tacs and water wouldn't taint the actual saliva test, and then I finally headed out the door and told myself, I am not leaving that COVID testing site until I get enough saliva for this thing to work. And so I walked to a testing center, one that was actually different from the one I had originally gone to, because it was slightly closer and <laughs> so that I wouldn't feel the remnants of failure that had occurred on that other site about a month ago. Once I started the test, I had little progress at first. The same gag reflexes were coming back as I continued to try different spitting strategies while simultaneously trying not to appear like a maniac to the other people who were testing. But slowly, very slowly, I started to gather saliva, and I'm not exaggerating when I say it was the most exciting moment of the week when I took a look at my tube and saw that little amount of saliva I had just accumulated. By the time three to four waves of testers had already passed, I had gotten around 75% of the required amount of saliva. I tried to produce more, but after realizing that I couldn't, I asked the desk receptionist if this was enough. He said yes, and accepted my saliva sample. That night, I received my results. The test had indeed successfully gone through, and I tested negative for COVID-19. 
From that day, October 4th, until the time I left campus in late November, I was compliant with the UIUC bi-weekly testing policy by developing a routine in which every Wednesday and Saturday I would eat Tic Tacs, drink water, wait some time, and then go get tested. Yes, I kept on experiencing the gag reflexes, and yes, it would take me much longer than the average person to produce the required amount of saliva, but fortunately I was able to continue testing, and I tested negative each time. Now that I'd fixed my saliva issue, I turned my attention toward the disciplinary process. The university made clear the policy of bi-weekly testing, but nowhere could I find the potential sanctions or punishments for this specific violation, which was concerning to me because I wanted to know what I had gotten myself into. Instead, I read up on general possibilities for sanctions for any violation, which included reprimand, censure, conduct probation, and even dismissal. At the time, I was fairly confident that once I got to explain my personal situation to my case coordinator, including all of the preventative measures that I took to ensure that I would not catch nor spread COVID-19, that I would be let off with a warning or a reprimand on the condition that I continue bi-weekly testing until it is no longer required. On October 9th, I met via Zoom video chat with my case coordinator, who was sympathetic to my case, and I appreciated that a lot. However, he informed me that he had been directed by the UIUC Faculty Senate Committee on Student Discipline to forward COVID-19 testing non-compliance cases like mine to a subcommittee, which would then decide my guilt or innocence, as well as my sanctions. What shocked me was when he then informed me that the most likely sanctions I would receive were conduct probation on the lighter side and a dismissal on the harsher side. It was at this point that I started to keep my parents in the loop regarding this entire situation. As stated on the UIUC Office of Student Conflict Resolutions website, conduct probation is, quote, a strong communication that a student is no longer in good disciplinary standing with the academic community, and that if the student fails to comply with any assigned sanctions or otherwise violates the student code while on probation, they should expect to be suspended or dismissed from the university. Cases resulting in conduct probation are reported to the dean of the student's college and remain a reportable entry in the student's disciplinary record for seven years." End quote. Conduct probation is typically given to students who are found guilty of significant violations involving academic integrity, inappropriate drug use, or even assault. As for dismissal, the website states, quote, "...dismissal shall be imposed upon a student when the appropriate subcommittee or the SCSD determines that the student's relationship with the university must be terminated. While dismissed, a student may not enroll in or attend any courses at the university and may not be awarded a degree from the university." End quote. Dismissal is typically given to students who are found guilty of multiple conduct probation deserving violations, as well as some acts that I do not wish to say to avoid the risk of YouTube taking this video down due to the sheer offensive nature of these acts. The Subcommittee on Student Conduct was scheduled to meet regarding my case on October 16th. During this meeting, I was to be present, give a 10-minute opening statement, and answer any questions that the committee members may have. Now, I knew that the statement I had prepared beforehand, which explained my situation in a detailed but precise manner, would take me about 15 minutes to read out loud. So I emailed my case coordinator asking if I could have some extra time to read the entire thing. He responded with, quote, I think that will be fine. Unfortunately, when the hearing began, and I asked if I could have more than 10 minutes to fully describe and rationalize my case, this request was rejected, so I had to rush my speaking a little bit and skip a few of the more unessential parts. In my statement to the subcommittee, which consisted of both students and faculty, I discussed my difficulty producing saliva, the gag reflexes, my attempts to find a way to spit, evidence that I was indeed struggling with this issue, and of course I described how I solved my saliva issue, how I have tested negative each time, and that I would continue my bi-weekly testing schedule until it is no longer required. I explained my reasoning for not reaching out to the McKinley Health Center to seek help, and why it was wrong of me not to. I also explained how I later did contact the health center, and would continue to stay in contact so that I would know what to do in case my dry mouth condition came back. I explained the preventative measures I took so that I would reduce my chances of transmission to essentially zero, including taking all online classes, following all masking and distancing protocols, not attending any large social gatherings, and creating my dorm building's social communication platform via Discord as an alternative 
shift to in-person meetings. I also listed for full transparency the places I had been, including the gas station, the outside tennis courts, Chipotle, and Taco Bell. I explained that because of my preventative measures, I never actually caught COVID-19. My evidence for this included, one, the fact that my roommate, who spent the majority of each day next to me, because we share a desk, never tested positive for COVID-19. Two, the fact that nobody in my dorm building ever caught COVID-19 as evidenced by several emails sent out by our building staff. And three, the fact that ever since I resumed COVID testing, I tested negative each time. On a side note, I recently supported and basically confirmed the fact that I never had COVID-19 when on July 13th, 2021, I received a COVID-19 antibody test via LabCorp, which determined that my blood sample, quote, does not contain detectable antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein receptor binding domain. In other words, someone who has been previously infected with COVID would have such antibodies for an indeterminate amount of time. Some scientists estimate that antibodies remain seven months after infection, while others estimate that they remain for a lifetime. We do not know exactly, but as of early July 2021, it was determined that I did not have these antibodies. I then attempted to prove to the subcommittee that I am not a troublesome student and pointed out some patterns in my behavior that indicate that I would never plan to break the student code of conduct ever again. I did this by listing a few of my academic achievements as well as my extracurricular pursuits, including my honor status at the college, my work on video production in social media, my self-published book and how to engage in productive debates, my acceptance into the university's top symphony orchestra, my progress in planning and creating the university's weekly news show, my joining of several extracurricular activities, and my updated grades in the seven courses I was taking at the time, all of which were in the A and A plus range. After finishing my statement and answering my questions from the committee, I was moved into a waiting room. Predictably, they found me in violation of the COVID-19 testing policy, which I agree was the correct decision. Next, however, came the more crucial part, which was determining the sanctions or punishments. I was moved back into the waiting room and sat anxiously awaiting the results. A few minutes later, I was moved back in. The subcommittee concluded, quote, from the beginning of September through October 9th, you have not complied with required university COVID testing. As a student residing in the geographic area mandated for testing, you are required to test twice per week. During this time, you have admitted to leaving your room to go to your dorm building's dining hall, and you left your dorm building to move about the campus community and have patronized local businesses. The punishment as determined by the committee was 1. A dismissal from the university for one year. Two, a trespass notice physically banning me from university property subject to enforcement by the University of Illinois Police Department. And three, in order to be readmitted, I must complete a petition letter, quote, outlining my intents to pursue readmission, the specific changes I've made, what I have learned during my dismissal, and why the subcommittee should consider my petition. I must also complete academics at another college or gather work experience, I must complete mandated service, and I must write a, quote, 1500 word research paper on the topic of COVID-19 transmission, spread, and mitigating risk. The sanctions were to become effective once I complete the appeals process if I chose to submit an appeal. On October 23rd, I submitted my appeal, including a detailed letter explaining my situation in full. In this letter, I explained the facts of my case, including a full timeline of events, the measures I took to minimize my chances of transmission, evidence that I indeed never caught COVID because of these measures, examples of my academic propensity and extracurricular pursuits, my enthusiastic willingness to remain compliant with the testing policy until no longer necessary, reasons why the first subcommittee may have incorrectly decided on an overly strict sanction, and lastly, the immediate and subsequent consequences that a dismissal sanction would have on me and my family. On November 5th, 12 days after I submitted my letter, I received a notice that the Senate Committee on Student Discipline would hear and decide upon my case on November 9th. Then on November 11th, I received the Appeal Committee's final decision. It read, quote, After a complete examination of the written appeal and the record of the case, the Senate Committee concluded that none of the grounds for appeal had been met. Thus, the Senate Committee has affirmed the subcommittee's original decision, which included the following finding of fact. And then the email ended with the exact decision made by the original subcommittee, including the list of all sanctions. 
Sadly, I was not able to find out the reasoning for this decision. This was officially the end of the disciplinary process. Several days after I got that email, my parents drove to the university, helped me pack, and drove me back home. About one month ago, in mid-June 2021, my case coordinator was kind enough to meet with me once more via Zoom to answer any questions I had in preparation for this very video. I asked him if he could clarify certain facts about my case and about the general disciplinary process to ensure that the information I am providing you is complete and accurate. During this meeting, I also expressed to him my absolute dedication to respecting the privacy of all non-public figures mentioned in this video. If you get a sense that I am purposefully avoiding mentioning a person or location's name, this is solely for privacy reasons. That being said, and this is the most serious statement I will make today, if somebody watching this video proactively searches for the names of redacted people or locations for the purpose of harassment, not only do I condemn this behavior, but I will ensure to do everything in my power to remove you from any community I create or am a part of, and if it ever comes to it, support anyone who uses legal means to stop you. Now, my case coordinator did inform me that I am indeed allowed to release relevant communications between myself and university faculty so long as the information being conveyed is not confidential. Additionally, I am allowed to discuss the disciplinary cases of other students with their permission. I have made sure that all of the information and evidence I provide you, and have already provided you earlier, is allowed to be released publicly. In the first part of this video, I gave you a detailed timeline of events. The second part of this video will expand upon this timeline, but I will also offer you my retrospective thoughts and opinions on this entire matter. I... I have a dilemma. I have been charged with a code of conduct violation by the disciplinary body of a very respected university, a charge that resulted in a dismissal from the same. Any attempt to question the soundness or rationality of this dismissal sanction would naturally be met with extreme skepticism and, more worryingly, outright assumptions of immaturity on my part by future college admissions officers, by future employers, and by the public. In speaking my thoughts about this situation, I risk appearing, frankly, like a moral fool. In questioning the decision made by both the Subcommittee on Student Conduct and the Senate Committee on Student Discipline, I risk the very real chance that I am indeed blindsided by my own bias that the university actually made a 100% correct decision. And by making this video, I expose myself as someone who has not learned a thing from the just punishment he was given. There is a chance that there is some information or some context that I just have not considered and that would render the university's decision correct. Sometimes I wish this could be the case. I wish that I could be past this already. I, I wish that there was no conflict between how the university handled my case and how I believe the university should have handled my case. This way, I would be able to admit full fault, learn a valuable lesson, and move forward in congruence with this institution and all others. But as easy as it would be to claim full wrongdoing and avoid conflict, I cannot in good faith do that to myself. The Golden Rule, a maxim in many cultures and religions, says to treat others the way you want to be treated. As put by internet personality Alex O'Connor, the golden rule of punishment 
is that the punishment must be proportionate to the crime. If your system of justice does not adhere to this principle during sentencing, your punishments become arbitrary, and as a result, your punishments become unreasonable. By choosing not to receive bi-weekly COVID-19 testing, I made a decision that I regret. I was not as certain as I could have been given the resources provided that I did not have COVID-19, which would have been more assuring for me and for others when I visited my dorm's dining hall, as well as a few other places on and off campus to get food. But it is absolutely crucial in any fair justice system to consider all consequences and all mitigating circumstances. These circumstances include, and are not limited to, the fact that I had a genuine dry mouth condition that did not allow me to test at first, the fact that all seven of my courses and all of my extracurricular activities were entirely online, the fact that I never attended any large gatherings or events, the fact that I created my dorm building's online substitute for in-person communication and gatherings. The fact that besides testing, I followed every other COVID safety protocol. The fact that I presented substantive evidence that I never caught nor spread COVID-19 as a result of the preventative measures I had taken. The fact that starting October 4th up until the day I left campus, I maintained a steady bi-weekly testing schedule. And the fact that I am not an otherwise troublesome student as evidenced by my academic record and my clean disciplinary record. To analyze whether or not proportionate punishment was achieved, we must compare the crime with the punishment. Out of all the sanctions applied to my record, the dismissal was by far the most consequential due to both the immediate effects and its implications for my future. The dismissal went into effect in November 2020, a few weeks before the academic semester was to end. A dismissal, whenever it takes place, forces the student to withdraw from all current courses. This means that all of the time and the dedication that I had put into my seven courses, starting in late August and during the entirety of September, the entirety of October, and the first half of November, all of that work was wiped away as if I had never attended college that semester. Another consequence of the dismissal was the loss of finances. This dismissal cost me and my family an amount totaling around $10,000 due to wasted tuition, wasted housing, and miscellaneous costs like textbooks, transportation, supplies, and more. In my letter of appeal, I predicted a $20,000 loss because I did not anticipate partial refunds. However, I start to see much larger numbers when factoring in the amount of time lost for my studies, resulting in an opportunity cost for one year of a full-time attorney salary, which could be anywhere from $60,000 to $200,000. One residual effect of dismissal, and I'm not sure myself how far this will go, will be the skepticism and perhaps outright rejection of my future college applications, law school applications, internship applications, and perhaps employment applications as a result of having a dismissal on my record. On all future pursuits, whenever I see the question, have you ever been punished by an educational institution, I will have to answer, yes, I was dismissed from the University of Illinois. Given the enormous amount of qualified applicants trying to get into a top law school, for example, to have a dismissal, not just a reprimand or censure or even conduct probation, but a dismissal from a large and respected university, to have that on my record is frankly devastating. And I will never be able to know just how much this sanction will affect my future. On top of the dismissal is a trespass notice. I am prohibited from stepping foot on university property unless I choose to move forward with a petition, complete the 1500 word COVID transmission essay, log mandated service, and gather academic or work experience. Even then, readmission is not guaranteed since a hearing must take place to decide my fate. To me, 
it does not seem like proportionate punishment was achieved. To me, it seems like what happened is a group of fundamentally good people tried to do good things by creating a novel policy intended to keep the community safe from a virus. However, the same group made a mistake in the enforcement of a particular section of this new policy, the COVID-19 testing non-compliance section. Instead of implementing a system that would work with each willing student, reach out to look for solutions, give multiple warnings, and apply proportionate justice when necessary, this group prioritized punitive damage. And in many cases, this punitive damage was excessive to an absurd degree. Despite their good intentions, this group of people acting on behalf of the university made a mistake. I am not the only student who received harsh sanctions. If you search on Google or on Reddit's quote, UIUC testing non-compliance, you will find a bevy of individual stories and U of I students detailing their cases and their punishments. While I cannot verify each of these posts truthfulness, they are plentiful and they all follow a similar pattern. Students receiving harsh and lengthy sanctions for seemingly minor offenses, like students missing their COVID tests for a week, or students forgetting to update their location on the university website. The first of these cases, however, that went semi-viral was the case of Ivor Chen, a PhD student in physics. I should first note that in discussing other students' cases, I speak only for myself while functioning merely as a spectator, since the amount of information available to me may be limited. However, here is what I found. Ivor Chen was dismissed from the University of Illinois on January 29th, 2021 for COVID-19 testing non-compliance. During the fall 2020 semester, Ivor lived with his immunocompromised mother while completing his studies entirely online. According to the graduate employees organization at the university, the only times Ivor left his house was for essential activities. The controversy started when during the fall semester, Ivor did not complete COVID testing as mandated. This was because he was not aware that he was part of the group of people who are required to get tested given his status as both a graduate student and an employee who was not working on campus. When he found out that he indeed needed to receive bi-weekly testing, he applied for an exemption, and because of his mother's increased vulnerability and the risk that bi-weekly testing would present, he successfully received one. Unfortunately, in order to account for the time that he was not receiving testing during the fall semester while not having a testing exemption, he was charged with COVID-19 testing non-compliance with the following sanctions. One, dismissal from the university for one year effective immediately. Two, two 1,000 word reflective essays. Three, a trespass notification that prohibits Ivor from setting foot on university property subject to enforcement by the university police department and four, a petition letter for university reentry after one year, 80 hours of community service, and evidence of successful academic or work history during his one year dismissal. The reason his case gained an immense amount of public attention, aside from the extremely disproportionate nature of the sanctions, is that since Ivor is an international student, a dismissal from the university would cause his visa to be revoked, and as a result, he and his mother would be subject to deportation. News of the university's disciplinary body's mistake was met with a massive public outcry and a petition that gained over 40,000 signatures. Additionally, according to the Graduate Employees Organization, quotes, more than five professors in Ivor's department and college, including Ivor's department head, his department's associate head for graduate programs, the dean of Ivor's college, and the associate dean for graduate professional and online programs, wrote emails and signed a letter of support for Ivor explaining in clear terms that this discipline was not proportionate to the victimless offense Ivor had inadvertently committed. Following this public response, the Senate Committee for Student Discipline reconvened on February 16th to quote, evaluate new information related to his case. 
During this meeting, they changed his dismissal sanction to a dismissal held in abeyance and conduct probation until graduation. Also, he must still write two 1,000-word reflective essays and complete 25 hours of community service. Assuming the facts released about his case are accurate and within full context, conduct probation until graduation, in addition to the other sanctions, is still a majorly disproportionate punishment. The only difference between Ivor's behavior in the fall semester and the spring semester is that in the spring semester, Ivor obtained a testing exemption upon finding out that he needed one. This was all either a failure of the university to clearly communicate a new policy, or this was Ivor's misunderstanding of a new policy, or a little bit of both. Whichever it is, with a little more understanding and compassion, all of this could have been solved without the involvement of any disciplinary process. Ivor applied for and received an exemption upon finding out that he needed one, and that could have been the end. But he still needed to be punished. And if it was not for his international status and the threat of deportation, he would likely still be dismissed to this day. The second student who went viral locally because of his COVID-19 testing non-compliance case was Antonio Ruiz, a graduate student studying mathematics. This case was a little more complicated than the Ivor Chen case, which is why I would recommend reading up on it using the information that I listed in the description of this video. But here is a quick summary. Antonio was a UIUC student with medical conditions that made it very difficult for him to receive bi-weekly COVID testing. In October, he was placed on conduct probation for testing non-compliance, after which he moved out of his on-campus residence for several months. When he came back for the spring semester, he attempted to receive a COVID testing exemption. But because he lived in university housing, he was not able to receive one. According to the Graduate Employees Organization, the GEO, he was not aware that a nasal swab alternative existed. And this was likely because the university did not communicate the existence of a nasal swab alternative in any mass mails or private communications until mid-March 2021. Antonio first found out about the nasal swab alternative on March 25th during a second hearing about his COVID testing non-compliance. Upon finding out, he applied for the alternative the next day, and he remained compliant with the university policy until the time he left campus. Also, according to Antonio, while attempting to change his his mailing address, he accidentally changed his student location. This caused him to receive an additional charge of, quote, violating section 1302G, providing false or misleading information to a member or agent of the university acting in the performance of his or her duty, or failing to comply with reasonable directions of a member or agent of the university acting in the performance of his or her duty. This was the charge he was found guilty of. The resultant sanctions included 1. Dismissal from the university effective immediately, 2. Trespass notification excluding Antonio from entering any university property effective immediately, including Antonio's primary residence in university housing, 3. 1. 1,000 word reflective essay, 4. A petition letter for university re-entry after one year, and 5 evidence of successful academic or work history during his one-year dismissal. After this, a petition was made in support of Antonio Ruiz, which has garnered over 3,500 signatures, but so far there have been no changes made to his sanctions by the university. I have personally been speaking with Antonio over the last few weeks, and he was kind enough to write a letter for this video offering some additional details about his case, which you can access in this video's description. I want to read a few excerpts. In the letter, he wrote, quote, because of my gastroesophageal reflux disease, I have to constantly be eating small amounts of food in order to avoid getting acid reflux. My primary care doctor at McKinley wrote a letter in support of me, stating that I cannot complete the saliva test due to the requirement of not being able to eat an hour before. I have polycystic kidney disease. My kidneys do not function well, and I have to take medication for the rest of my life. I was sheltering in place because I am at an increased risk of complications from COVID-19. 
I presented medical documentation spanning multiple years of treatment. During my hearing, the chair appointed by the OSCR was dismissive of my concerns, stating that my medical documents were too old because they were from 2017, even though my conditions are chronic. My conditions don't go away, and there is no good treatment for them either. I have been registered with Disability Resources and Educational Services, DRES, since fall 2017. The OSCR representatives asserted that I had to contact the McKinley Health Center to arrange for accommodations. However, I submitted multiple testing exemption forms explaining my medical situation before my charge and never received a response for any of my submissions." End quote. In the end, Antonio was kicked out of his PhD program evicted from university housing, and was fired from his teaching assistant job, which was his sole source of income. Was this proportionate punishment? Here's something. In November of 2020, I messaged my friend James from my economic statistics course that I was not able to complete the assignment for that week because I was dismissed from the university. When I told him that the university had dismissed me, it was, to my shock, when he told me, quote, Oh my god, me too. He described to me how he had missed COVID testing for a period of three weeks, part of which he was not on campus. Despite the preventative measures he took during this period, the fact that ever since he became compliant he has always tested negative, and his eager willingness to remain compliant until no longer necessary, he was dismissed. As COVID vaccinations ramp up and testing becomes less necessary, the university's disciplinary procedures for testing non-compliance will become less relevant. While testing may soon reach an end, students like Ivor Chen will continue to remain on conduct probation, have a stained university record, and be subject to dismissal if he commits another violation. Students like Antonio Ruiz and my friend James will continue their struggle to recover from the devastating impact of a dismissal sanction, including the loss of academic credits, the loss of finances, the loss of time, and their tarnished university record. From the information that I found, and was given, I just cannot get myself to believe that what happened to these students was just. These were students who were genuinely good people, who were just trying to do their best to face their individual struggles, whether it was taking care of an immunocompromised family member, or worrying about how to live and function with overbearing chronic disabilities. These were not troublesome students, and they did not refuse to comply with COVID testing because they didn't want to. These were students who took COVID seriously, who followed all other safety protocols, and who were trying to comply. Could each of these students have done more? Certainly. Ivor could have proactively reached out to somebody at the university to check his testing requirement status or his need to receive an exemption. Antonio could have called the McKinley Health Center earlier to ask about possible alternatives to the saliva test. James could have been more proactive in this way also, and of course, so could have I. Someone might tell these students, or tell me, something like, had you just followed the bi-weekly testing policy, you wouldn't be receiving a dismissal. That's fair. There's nothing false about that statement. In my case particularly, there are many variables that had one of them been different, I probably would not have been dismissed. If I had just called the McKinley Health Center a month sooner, I probably wouldn't have been dismissed. If I had just drank some water and had Tic Tacs before my very first COVID test, I probably wouldn't have been dismissed. If the university tracking system had not malfunctioned during the beginning of the semester and had sent me a warning a few days after my initial non-compliance as opposed to a month afterward, I probably wouldn't have been dismissed. If the university had given me more than one warning, or more clearly communicated the consequences for testing non-compliance earlier, or more publicly advertised the nasal swab alternative, I probably wouldn't have been dismissed. The issue with dismissing my concerns by saying this wouldn't be happening to you if you had just followed the rules is that 
But this is not actually a counter-argument to my own. And you could make the same point had the punishment been a mere warning or the death penalty. I hope you would see the moral flaw in the statement, had you just not stolen that pencil, you wouldn't have received a life sentence in prison. My argument is not that each of these students did everything perfectly, but that their punishments were disproportionate to their actions. As I said previously, the Senate Committee on Student Discipline's response to my letter of appeal was one sentence which said, quote, After a complete examination of the written appeal and the record of the case, the Senate Committee concluded that none of the grounds for appeal had been met. I am fully aware that, by policy, I'm not entitled to information. I am not entitled to people's time. But if my actions were so immoral that they warranted a dismissal from the university, it would be extremely relieving to know how. Because I want to better myself by learning from what I did wrong. At this moment, I just cannot get myself to believe that what I did, or rather failed to do, was so immoral that it warranted a dismissal. So far, every single person who I have confided in regarding this situation, including my parents, my roommates, UIUC undergraduate students, graduate students, teaching assistants, professors, truly every single person who I have talked to has expressed to me in one way or another that the university's decision in my particular case was wrong. After I explained my dry mouth condition, instead of getting help and understanding from the university, I was issued one generic warning and then almost immediately was dismissed from the university for COVID testing non-compliance, for a behavior that I had already corrected by the time I first met with my case coordinator. I received the absolute harshest punishments, despite the fact that all of my courses were online, that I never attended any large gatherings, that I followed all other safety protocols, and that I have substantive evidence that I never contracted nor infected anyone with COVID-19. Still, I was forced to withdraw from all of my courses late into the semester. I have a dismissal on my university record. I am not allowed to take step onto university property, and my family lost $10,000. If my case was an example of proportionate punishment, I would like to know how. And I, I don't mean to be facetious, I genuinely need to know how for the sake of my morals. If I made a mistake, I am ready and willing to take responsibility. In that good spirit, I hope the university is ready and willing to do the same. Looking back, after I had already been non-compliant with the university testing policy for a little over a month, it seemed as if dismissal was inevitable. I didn't know it at the time, but there was no changing the outcome. So aside from my participation in the process itself, this situation and everything thereafter was, in a way, a test. A test of my emotional strength and a test of my mental strength. And of course, whenever you take an important test, you have to have a strategy. In this case, mine was taking the role of a delusional optimist. My roommate would affirm the fact that right after I told him I was dismissed, I kept saying stuff like, I'm just gonna have to turn this into something good. At one point I remember him asking me, how are you not, like, dying right now? If this happened to me, I'd be freaking out. Which, in my opinion, wouldn't have been an invalid reaction. By the way, my roommate has been just so supportive and absolutely <laughs> great about this entire situation, and I am very thankful for that. On November 20th, I moved out of my dorm building and back into my parents' house. There were a lot of things I needed to take care of in regard to my future. 
I first enrolled in my local community college for the spring 2021 semester and took on 18 credit hours worth of courses, which was the maximum amount allowed without a special exemption. I also took an additional two courses over the summer, after all of which I was able to earn a cumulative 4.0 GPA. Regardless of my grades, however, I think my highest achievement was finally completing a semester in college. I was starting to think it was never going to happen. Recently, one of my government-related course professors told me that he would be nominating me for a school award and, if possible, recommending me for an internship in Washington, D.C. That would be pretty cool. Also, two of my courses were related to journalism, both taught by the same professor, who was very good to me. He wrote me a letter of recommendation for several colleges I applied to, he recruited me to write for the school newspaper, and he even offered me a paid position at the newspaper if I chose to stay at the college during the next semester. Right now, my plan is to find a way to major in both journalism and economics, and after graduation, go to law school. As those of you who are subscribed to my YouTube channel know, law is something I am very passionate about and interested in. By the way, if anyone watching right now knows of any law, economics, or journalism-related internships that you recommend I apply to, feel free to send me an email. At this particular moment, I am in the middle of deciding when I want to transfer to another university. Hopefully I will be able to make an announcement on that front soon, but what I can say with near certainty is that I will not be returning to the University of Illinois. I've also pursued things outside the educational front. I've been reading, writing, playing tennis, hanging out with friends, playing the piano and the bass, going to the gym, and making the occasional YouTube video. Those of you who regularly watch my videos know of my 100,000 push-up challenge, which I was successfully able to complete in less than three months. I think I can probably disclose the fact that this challenge has led to some insane opportunities and while I can't talk about them yet, the wait will be worth it, I promise. Since last year, I've been able to steer this ship in a positive direction, in a way, make the best of it. But I also know that many students who were affected by the disproportionate enforcements of university policy have not been able to do the same. If you are a UYUC student listening to this who feels like you were given an unfair punishment for a COVID-19 testing non-compliance violation and are struggling because of it, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via email, Twitter, or Instagram. Everyone watching, I hope I was able to give you a satisfactory description about everything that happened, about my thoughts, and about my future. Feel free to view the description of this video down below for all the pieces of evidence that I mentioned in this video, including documents, letters, and articles. If you want to show support, have a question or criticism, I welcome you to leave a comment. I have been wanting to get this situation off my chest for about 10 months now, and now that I have, it feels great. Thanks for watching.